Welcome to a very special Expo North Digital Shorts. We have Rob Twigger here, the author. He's an adventurer. He's really a polymath. He's done a lot. He's an artist. He does beautiful photography as well. And he has a library of books that are some of my favorites. Rob, I'm so happy to have you here. And I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Many Welcome. miles away, yeah. <laughs> I know. Welcome from my lockdown to your lockdown. Yeah. Your lockdown looks a lot more literary. You have all your books in the background. I have, yeah. I mean, I was going to do it in the kitchen, but uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> see a few books there. Mm. Um, um, yeah. Rob, I'm so happy to have you here. We have so much to chat about, and I'm going to try to fit everything into the 15 minutes that we have. We'll probably run over. But we're here to talk about your new book, Walking the Great North Line. North yeah, Line. I'll just show you the copy. Hold on. Here it is. Well, walking the Great North Line. Oh, map. beautiful. Yeah. That's a great cover from Stonehenge. Yeah. Yes, love it. Stonehenge to Lindisfarne. Actually, I walked a bit further, but I think they put Stonehenge on there for recognition. <laughs> you know, like everyone knows where that is. Yeah, and um, you're, you're also, I just want to make clear, you have so many beautiful books from a series called The Red Nile, White Mountain, to one of your very first Angry White Pajamas, and a book called Micromastery, which is one of my favorites. I absolutely love it. Um, we'll put a link to all of Rob's books below so you can find out a little bit more about his work. But today we're going to dive into your new book, which is pretty much a sneak peek. It's hot off the presses, isn't it? Yep, yep. It was only published a day or two ago, yeah. Congratulations, Rob. It's, it's really okay. wonderful. So the whole book talks a little bit about ley lines and having an adventure. So we're going to talk a little bit about the book first. And then for folks at home who've had adventures and want to write about them or want to have some adventures, we're going to get into the kind of physics of how to have a good adventure. So please first tell us a little bit about your book. Okay, so the book started with, um, I, I'd had a desire to do a walk up England for years and all my books have been set in foreign countries exotic places so i finally thought i've got i want to do something about england but i didn't want to walk the normal routes i think there's something very boring about doing the pennine way or the cotswold way not just as you know as a walk it would be great but uh to write about it it's just, just you can't find anything new mm -hmm. so one day i was i unwrapped this Ordnance Survey map of Great Britain, which had all the ancient sites on. And I, I'd already known, and this has been known for centuries, that Stonehenge, Old Sarum and Avebury, which are three ancient sites, are all on a north-south line. So just for fun, I extended that line with a metre ruler all the way up to the north of England, and it went through Lindisfarne Island, which was an amazingly um, suggestive coincidence, because Lindisfarne is an ancient monastery, one of the earliest sites of Christianity. It also has Neolithic and Paleolithic remains, as you'd expect, and somewhere like that. So I then started looking along this line, and there were lots of other sites on the line. In fact, I counted 42 major ancient sites. Now you, okay, there are loads and loads of barrows and forts and henges around Britain. So I thought, okay, it's got to be a coincidence. So I started ruling lines every 10 or 20 miles either side. And there is not a single line that has anything like as many on. None, not wrong. I mean, there's one about um, probably, uh, yeah, you know, 15 miles further further to the east that goes through the White Horse, Uffington, and Rollwright Stones, but then it peters out again, which is actually a characteristic of a lot of ley lines. This is not a ley line, by the way, that I walked, but ley lines are you know, alignments, usually short alignments of significant objects. And, um, but to find one that goes all the way uh, uh, due north is is quite extraordinary but what we know about ancient man we're talking before even the celts we're talking uh, you know just post the ice age really is how sophisticated they were at using uh, the stars for navigation and there's lots of evidence that these straight line routes were existing in europe uh, before the romans got here so um it doesn't, it's not completely implausible, but even if it was, even if it was a complete coincidence, it gave a really good reason for me to walk up England and investigate all these ancient sites and to find out what it meant to be English um, in, in as much as England is a country that's been invaded so many times. Is there anything that resides, you know, that is of the earth, so to speak, or from the most early inhabitants? So that was really the inspiration. So it's kind of... Um, uh, an exploration. It's not really archaeological because the archaeological ev evidence changes a little bit, but the archaeological speculation changes so much 
I decided I put in, you know, the bare bones of the explanations, but really it's, it's more about what you can intuit. It's more of an artistic uh, endeavor and exploration, I suppose. Can I ask why? So I love that because it has personal significance for you too, not just about what it means to be English and um, finding, kind of going back through time to find um, a perspective on modern identity. However, you also bring people with you that are from your past, from previous adventures. Yeah. So why not do it alone? Why bring those people in? Well, walk, uh, there's a technical challenge. I mean, also, I wanted to do a walkbook because there is a technical challenge in walkbooks because if you're on your own, it's just one damn thing after another. So you need, you, you ideally, you need some form of Sancho Panza. You know, Don Quixote had just been on his own. That book would have petered out pretty fast. You know, you need a companion. You need a foil. So, I mean, the, the, the classic is, is Robert Louis Stevenson with his, with his donkey. Um, so I needed, you know, a, a, and you can have a human donkey, you know, somebody you go with. Uh, so I, but I didn't want to do it with just one person because then it becomes about the relationship. And this book is not about my relationship with another person. So, um, yeah, so it, it, I, it, you need other people to bring new material in. And also when you travel pe with different people, you see and experience different things. Yeah. And that's just an amazing fact. Like as soon as I started walking with this guy, John Zada, we started seeing, seeing things that I, I mean, he's a Canadian, he's not English. So he, I started to see things through his eyes and it just became much more bizarre, the journey. Um, so that, I wanted to put that in. And also I've done it before in a couple of my books. I've used people who've been on previous expeditions. So for people who have read my books, there's a kind of in, in interest in seeing these ongoing characters reappear. There's also, because you know them so well, I think there's a more profound way of seeing how someone's changed throughout the years than having just gotten a stranger to join you. In <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, there's that, there's that as well. So there was the, I mean, one of the themes in the book is, a, you know, a little bit about dealing with how, um, you know, the ups and downs of life and um, what, and my experience as I've got older, you know, knowing quite a few people who have suffered depression and, and rather rather serious mental ailments and uh and indeed on the walk a guy i go with is has depression and later is cured of it um not because of my walk but it was the start and then he went on to do the santiago walk and several other walks and he's he's completely recovered so is there something um, therapeutic about walking oh yeah definitely absolutely but with the caveat if you're walking alone and you're a bit down and uh it's england rather than a country another country where everyone's friendly um it could make it worse and in fact there is a there's a there's a travel book by this guy called keith foskett who who starts walking in scotland and he gets and he's, he's a bit depressed and he gets more and more depressed <laughs> and, and anyone who's walked through scotland in sort of like you know pouring rain probably it's, can sympathize yeah so yeah. it you know it's, it's one of those it could go either way you know Rob, you're not only such a good storyteller, I love the tone of the book. It's intimate, it's really interesting. So you mix a really intimate voice with what's going on with you, what's going on with your companions, with some amazing facts about what you're doing, your kit, some practical things, some really philosophical things. It's and beautifully woven together. But in your recall, so this is what I was thinking about as I was reading. Yeah. Your recall about seeing a white hind. I don't want to give away too much yeah. or where you decide to put up camp or what yeah. people are saying. Are you keeping a diary along with you? Or okay, I have, I've evolved a system over time. Um, uh, emotional Events that have an emotional impact usually stay in your memory. So you don't need to worry too much about them. Things people say, you will never remember the exact wordage. Well, at least I never do. So as soon as someone says something witty or clever, um, or, or even if I do, uh, I whip out this very small diary. I shall show you the type of diary I've got. I've got one right here. Um, yes. Very oh, small. wow, it is tiny. Yes, yeah, and very, very flippity and, and, and not very substantial. It's got to be really handy. It's often in this top pocket. Bang, write it down. Yeah. Then in the evening, I force myself, and this is the most laborious and horrible task, I force myself to transcribe the, the witty and clever things people have said, any particular images that have struck me, like if there is some 
particular image that thinks that seems brilliant if that struck me but to be honest it's often what people have said yeah. that goes into the main journal book which i'm keeping and i it's a real pain to do that sometimes you know, if you're tired you're cold you've had your food you're feeling sleepy you've got to force yourself to do it because you that is key crucial mm -hmm. but at the same time i'm i take loads and loads of photographs i didn't used to i i I, I, you know, when I, when I used a film camera, I used to be quite parsimonious because you know, much money. So I didn't take hundreds of photos, but of course a digital camera, you can take hundreds of photos. And I probably take a thousand, maybe, maybe 2000 photos on that trip. So uh, that when I come to write it up, yeah, I just watch the photos. And so I've almost got a play by play view storyboard of mm. everything. Um, mm. So and then I've got the maps. The other thing is, um, if I'm too, let's say something happens en route, like a fall in a river or something, I will write it on the map as well. Yeah. So I have all these, these, these three elements. Now I have a friend who uses his phone as a recording device, which of course is probably even better. So he's walking along, he sees something, he says, oh yeah. Duh. But to me, the time to listen to it again. I mean, if, if you've ever transcribed tapes and stuff, I mean, an hour, imagine if you walk for eight hours. Yeah. I mean, it would just be appalling to me to have to go back with the earphones in and listen to my obvious disconnected rambling. Oh, well, also, also, you know, your, your idea of having the photographs I love, you're such a visual person anyway. I always think your books would make great films. Like I actually think this, this book in particular would make a, like a wonderful film. It's almost a road trip movie with these three companions who've traveled together before. Yeah. It's, I mean, this to me is a perfect, any producers out there, this is like a, a perfect um, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, option. Um, however, the photos allow you to also have some time of reflection. You're yeah. a writer, so I'm sure the stories percolate in your mind, in the back of your mind. So actually thinking about them post-fact might yeah. add a little bit more poetry than if you were just going to verbally yeah, yeah. as they're happening. It's certainly true, and it's a tip for writing. Um, to give writing density, you, you, you need to put in, you know, smells and... Um, sounds and other other senses but certainly if you look at a photograph and then r r try to write not what's going on and, and what it suggests it's it's a good technique and it can it can create a sort of hyper reality as well because you often see more more in it than there really is and and it's used by people like robert mcfarlane you just know he's looking at photographs when he's writing and it's not a bad thing but it's it's a kind of hyper reality you suddenly think wow did he really see that? I mean, of course he didn't. It's just like, but it's in the photo, you know. Well, Rob, you work really, I'm guessing you work very hard to make a conversational style, but with beautiful brushstrokes. So it's really highly crafted. Like you have these amazing brushstrokes that are quips about people's personalities or contrast to your life. You know, there's one at the very start when talking about your companions and having kids. Um, first your version of having kids at home and your friend's version. Um, I don't want to give anything away. It's just very okay. good. And that appears over and over again, these beautifully crafted little um, observations of people's character. How many redrafts do you do? Um, what I do... Uh, um, okay, uh, writing a travel book is or, or a book based on a real experience is easier than fiction for me, not for everybody, but for me it is because remember, I've already done a kind of a draft by doing the walk. Then there's a second draft of me writing the funny things people have said. Then there's a kind of a third draft when I'm putting them in the notebook. Then, so when I'm sitting down, I'm already filtered through quite a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I may even have told the stories to people. So I know which stories play well. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, and another tip, if you, if you go with somebody, before you start writing, ask them for th what they thought was good stuff. And sometimes they tell you things you've completely forgotten. That's happened on a number of occasions. So it's really worth doing. Then when I sit down, I write it straight through, all the way through. And um, I don't always stick to this, but I, I know it's a good rule is to print off every day's work, just print it off, okay. keep it there. Um, probably don't edit it. I mean, I... To, to keep going is the main thing. Then when I've finished, I leave it for 
a week or so. It's, the longer you leave it, the better, but it's usually only a week. I then print it off and just go through it. Um, and I don't really make it many notes, but I know I'm looking for the really big things that I need to chop and cut out. And then I cut out those big things and then I print it off again. And in general, this is really bad for the planet, but basically I have a rule. If in doubt, print it out. This is a really important rule for writers. If in doubt, print it out. The very act of printing out this document again without making any changes, changes the way you look at it. It's, it's almost magic. Um, so then you, you then make more changes. And the thing is, if the core is good, so if you, if, this is why it's different for fiction, because sometimes you don't know whether the core is good or not. So you can keep polishing and polishing a piece of fiction and it ends up useless. You know, you've, you've hollowed the whole thing out and it just falls apart. Mm -hmm. But when you know the core is good, like this walk, I knew the core is good. You know, it's the first time of this walk up England, got all these stuff. Da, da. So we, you have to tell yourself if the core is good. Subsequent polishings can only make it better. Even if you're doing a few things each time, just to change this, change this, change this. So I probably do, I, I, you know, go through it. I mean, it's sickening sometimes to have to keep going through it. Um, I don't know, four or five times printing it out. And, but sometimes I go through it really fast and I'm only looking for a few things. Yeah. And often at the beginning, it's really difficult to get into the pace so you you spend a disproportionate amount of time editing the beginning, and often the end as well. When you're Rob, when you're reading through it, how much um, are you thinking about when you write about other people? How much are you thinking about? Oh, I can't put that in, or I think that's okay to put in about them. And do you well, have what, a philosophy of? Yeah, I mean, I've got into trouble with this. I mean, one guy didn't speak to me for twenty two years because of what I'd said about him, and I could have changed his name. I could have changed his name. I mean, if I've got any bit of advice, and I didn't do it in this book, but if I've got any bit of advice, always change the names. Yeah. Just change the names. Um, just when you write it, you can never think, oh, I'm worried what my mum will think about this. If you do that, you're just, you're not a writer. You know, you, you've got to put everything down. Then, in the cold light of day, edit out the stuff you think will cause massive offense. And the weird thing is it's, it's usually very small things. It's very, very small things. But if you put the brakes on when you're writing, you will end up writing like an amateur. You know, if there's one thing that characterizes amateur writing, it's putting the brakes on and not writing everything. Yeah. So you, and same with humor. You've got to write the stupidest puns, crazy stuff. All of that can be edited out, but you cannot edit in humor. That's another rule of life. You can't edit in humor. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work cool. <laughs> and um so uh, even though hollywood pays millions to try and edit in humor into movies it just doesn't work so um that's that's the rule yeah you and that you and if you're really worried send it to them i mean i've done that before and they go oh i don't like that bit and it's like one tiny thing like you said they had a corn on their toe something really petty okay well it goes out yeah well, so i've had no complaints i've had no complaints from Nigel. Good. Even though I spilled all the beans about his 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 marriage and so forth. Yeah. He's pretty pretty solid, tough guy. He's yeah. said it's okay. I haven't heard back from Joe yet though. So mm -hmm. I went through it. And it's not too bad. What I said. It's not bad at all. I think mm -hmm. they both come out very well. Yeah. Book in, in general, and it's honest. It's nothing that you haven't. It's not true. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you're more you're more revealing about yourself than anyone, which is when. I feel like when doing writing, if you apply the same rules to yourself that you're doing to any of the characters that you're writing about, there seems to be a good, a good karma. It's okay. Yeah, okay. All right, yeah. Um, Rob, is there a recipe for a good adventure? Are there certain elements you have to have or it doesn't matter? Um, okay. The, this is the, the kind of the prime rule of adventure. Um, it's not my quotation but it's so true and that is um the spirit of adventure is not found on the highest mountain or in the, the deepest jungle it is exchanging the familiar hearth for an uncertain resting place so it's it's like if you don't know where you're going to sleep that night you're on an adventure that's awesome yeah so like hitchhiking can be like a total adventure or like you go to a new city and you actually don't know where you're going to go you know will it be a hotel will it be someone you've met you just don't know so that's the essence of an adventure and and it's why you you something that is super planned um 
will always you know however exotic the place it's never going to be an adventure unless an accident happens which is usually the case of you know these stories you read and as you don't really want to have a serious nasty accident it's you want to build as much of that into into the program and of course if you're traveling with someone there is more potential for adventure because you're with another uncertainty creating factor yeah. so that's the that's the sort of that's the essence yeah Go is there any possibility of us being able to have an adventure in our lockdown COVID time? Because everyone knows where they're going to sleep. Is there another element of adventure that we could have at the moment? I think it's, well, we were talking about art earlier and, um, and, and maybe it's being creative and it's doing some, because, you know, when you start a, a story, you don't know where you're going to go to bed that night. You know, ideally you could go anywhere. When you start drawing a picture, if you don't have a plan, it could go anywhere. So, and I've seen it actually on Instagram, people are posting a lot more of creative type stuff. So that's, that's the traditional response, isn't it? To lock down, because, go into your head and start creating. Um, I love that. That's, that's, that's really wonderful. Okay. What's next for you, Rob? What's on, what's on the adventure plate? What's coming up? Well, because of lockdown, I had to cancel my next book, which was going to be about wild camping on 36, islands in the lake district yeah that was a great idea um because there are 36 islands in the lake so everyone writes about the lake district mountains you know wainwright and all that stuff and i thought well what about writing about the lakes yeah. and then as a kid i'd always fantasized about sneaking onto these islands some of which you, you're not supposed to be on anyway that was all going to go but obviously can't do it in lo lockdown so i have resurrected a book i wrote i i've half written about all these desert trips I made, which I did, I don't know, nearly 10 years ago. Um, but one of them was searching for the crash site of this part of Antoine de Saint Exupery, the author of The Little Prince. And um, so that has become the main theme. So it's a book about uh, Antoine de Saint Exupery, but it's, it's also a, it's also mostly about the desert. That that sounds, that's the next book. Yeah. That sounds really, really wonderful. I can't read, wait, we read that one. And before we have to go, because I totally run over, but you're very yeah. wonderful to talk to. I would keep on going if I could. Um, can you leave us with a little bit of advice for those folks who want to write about an adventure that they've had already and they're thinking of putting it down to paper? One of the things you told me, which is something I stick by all the time, which is when you have good writing days and bad writing days, if you actually go through the pages, you yep. don't notice the difference. You don't know which day you had the bad day and which day you had the good day. It's exactly. In your mind. So, and sometimes it's painful. You're writing, especially if that's something you've done because you're bored with it. You know it, you've done it. You are simply doing essentially a documentary task. You are having, laying down the tracks, man. And it's not all going to be exciting. So the single biggest thing you can do is just get a routine. I mean, it's just as simple as that. So, and if you can write for two hours, I think if you write for less than two hours, it's, it's really hard. But if you can set aside two hour bulk or three hours is better, but two hours is fine. Three times a week, you will get a book done. No question. You will get it done. It's like going to the gym. If you go to the gym for two hours, three times a week, you will get fit. Uh, if you do it only twice a week, you may just maintain your fitness. So three is the breakthrough. But if you can do it five days a week, that's even better. But you have to have that routine. Um, and uh it is boring it's drudgery you know i mean i mean 50 percent of writing is probably drudgery just get used to it it's like cooking it's like everything everything is um uh, has a drudge element to it I think, <laughs> Sorry <about that. laughs> I, think, I think that's really realistic because if you expect it to be all entertainment and flowers and roses yeah. you won't get it done three times a week it will be really painful so yeah. have the right expectations that it's going to feel like yeah. work and not every writer's like that. You know, our writers say, oh, yeah, I'm just killing myself laughing as I'm sitting at my desk. And... No, okay, I'm great. not one of those either. Well, it doesn't always work like that. No. Rob, uh, you're just so wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us on Expo North Digital Shorts. Um, I can't wait to read what's coming up next, and we'll have links to your current book down below. Oh, it's been brilliant talking to you, as ever. And, you know, good luck with Expo North and everything. And we'll get you, we'll get you north one of these days. <laughs> What a terrible author I am. On TV, they take that off you. you. You probably know. When you're on TV, you're going on stage, you're holding your book, and they, t they literally rip it out. <laughs> we're not on TV now. Do it again. Let's see it again one more time. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. That's There's great. no studio assistant to rip that out of my hand. 